The year is 1791, and excitement stirs in the citizens of this new nation, this nation of 13 United States of America. A newly elected president governs the land under a document of laws called the Constitution. His name is George Washington, a military man who symbolizes the nation's long struggle for independence. But now, the battles are over. Americans are settling into their new country. The more adventuresome, curious about the fertile land west of the Allegheny Mountains, set about to explore this country. One such American was Daniel Doty. This New Jersey farmer, having journeyed west on horseback to Fort Pitt and down the Ohio by flatboat to Columbia the year before, set out on his own. He traveled up the Little Miami River and headed west until he came to an opening in the forest along the Great Miami River. This place would be called Middletown. Daniel Doty's spirit of exploration and discovery was typical of those early settlers. It was a pioneer spirit. It was an American spirit. The story of Middletown begins with the land. Once an island of limestone rising out of the sea, a long valley was carved by ancient glaciers. They crept over the land, leaving tons of drift material and a variety of soil deposits. A thick glacial ice cap filled in the valley, making a plain, but leaving a huge reservoir of water in the old valley. This underground water supply and the great river channels created alluvial valleys with rich soil. The geography of the area was settled, and now it was man's turn. For the next 10,000 years, Indians lived in the valley. Joy Jones is a local amateur archaeologist who has participated in many local digs. Uh, we called them Paleo Indians, and um, they followed the mastodons and mammoths through. That was after the uh, glacier had left the area. Uh, generally, as I understand, these sites were high up, and unfortunately I haven't, to my knowledge, found one of their nice paleo points yet. I'm still looking. Uh, then we would, uh, then there's kind of a transitional f stage. For a technical term, we call them plano, and then we get into a 6,000 year period called archaic, and they break it up early, middle, and late archaic. And that's why most of the material that you find in this area is archaic. I mean, for 6,000 years, people were dropping things and throwing things away. About 200 BC, uh, the Adena culture with what we're familiar with, the Miamisburg Mound, the West Middletown Mound, there's a beautiful mound over in Franklin. Um, and we have already pottery introduced, and this was coarse pottery with uh, kind of limestone tempering. So the Adena would have gone for maybe four or five hundred years and overlapping with them would have been Hopewell. Eventually, these ancient civilizations disappeared, merging into tribes of Indians living throughout the area. 
Members of the great Indian group known as the Algonquins, the Miamis were the first Indians in the valley to be encountered by white men. Headquartered at Pickawillany near present-day Piqua, the Miami Indians controlled a great empire from the Scioto River west to Illinois and from the Ohio River north to the site of Detroit. But their peaceful farming life was being threatened. While other Indian tribes were pushed west by the white man's settlements, the Miamis moved north. Realizing they would soon lose their remaining homes, they joined the fierce Shawnees and other tribes, setting the stage for a great struggle for control of the territory. Early descriptions of the Northwest Territory were widely read in the East. The land is fine, rich, level, well timbered with large walnut, ash, sugar, and cherry trees. It has a great number of little streams and abounds with turkeys, deer, elk, and buffalo, 30 or 40 of which can be seen feeding in one meadow. The grass here grows to a great height in the fields. The bottoms are full of clover, wild rye, and bluegrass. Many saw wealth and opportunity in the West, including the American government, badly in debt after the Revolutionary War. By 1788, more than 70,000 settlers had moved into the Kentucky area, but few, fearing Indian attacks, had ventured north across the Ohio River into the Miami Slaughterhouse, as it was then known. In the spring of 1786, Revolutionary War veteran Benjamin Stites explored the Fertile Valley between the Little and Great Miami Rivers and reported his findings to a New Jersey congressman also interested in the Western lands. His name was John Cleves Sims. Congress, while still drafting a federal constitution in Philadelphia, adopted the Northwest Ordinance in July 1787. The document officially opened the lands between the Alleghenies and the Mississippi River for sale and settlement. John Cleve Sims was ready to act. He applied to Congress and was granted a charter to develop a tract of land known as the Miami Purchase and immediately began to advertise. Among those attracted by the description of the territory was a young man named Daniel Doty. He was a born pioneer. Daniel Doty was a New Jersey farmer born in 1765 in uh, New Jersey and a direct descendant of Edward Doty who was uh, on the Mayflower, came over in, in uh, 1620. Bill Harrison is a direct in, uh, descendant of Daniel Doty. In 1790, Daniel Doty uh, left New Jersey and came uh, to Pittsburgh and then on down the Ohio River and landed near Cincinnati in 1790. In 1791, he went up the Little Miami River and across uh, some territory into the banks of the Great Miami River where he established a, his cabin and at that time, of course, in, in, uh, at that point, the Indians were, uh, were very um, uh, hostile in this area. In 1790, yeah. upon returning to Columbia, Daniel long. Doty heard yeah. the news of the defeat of General Harmer's army by the Miami Indians and their great chief, Little Turtle. Soon, Congress passed a measure to provide for adequate defense of the West. And on November 4, 1791, General Arthur St. Clair, then governor of the Northwest Territory, confronted Little Turtle on the Ohio headwaters of the Wabash River. In the Battle of a Thousand Slain, St. Clair's force was virtually annihilated, and the Miamis continued their fierce resistance to the white man's settlement. With these two overwhelming victories, the Indians became more daring, and the territory more dangerous. Reluctantly, Daniel Doty left the valley and returned to the safety of his New Jersey farm. In 1792, President Washington replaced Governor St. Clair as commander of the army with another hero of the revolution, General Mad Anthony Wayne. Wayne spent the next several months training and preparing a new army. After building several forts to protect his supply lines, they moved north in July of 1794. On the banks of the Maumee River near the present site of Toledo, Wayne's army met and defeated the Indian force led by Shawnee Chief Blue Jacket in the Battle of Fallen Timbers. 10,000 years of Indian occupation had come to an end. Wayne pulled back to his base camp at Greenville, and there on August 3, 1795, the Treaty of Greenville was signed, opening the Miami Valley and most of Ohio to white settlement. Following the treaty signing, uh, Daniel Doty, back in New Jersey, decided that uh, he would come back. So in 1796, he did return, 
uh, came back to down the Ohio River on the flatboat and uh, down in, into Cincinnati. And, and then, of course, he, at that point, he came, uh, got a pack horse and, uh, and, uh, and brought his possessions. And one of them, we, this cupboard behind me is one of the possessions that he brought with him from New Jersey. And uh, it's now here in Middletown. But it's one of those uh, the heirlooms that came down through the Doty family. When he returned to the original site where he had his first cabin, he found that the uh, first cabin, of course, was gone by this time. And he built another cabin on the site. And uh, was essentially, it was down on uh, what's now South Main Street uh, near the uh, uh, Barnett Stadium, uh, near the river at that point. The cabin was built there. And uh, of course, it's not there anymore, but there's a big tree there that they say was uh, probably there when Daniel Doty uh, his cabin was. The settlement had begun with one family in the wilderness. With his wife Betsy and son Joel, Daniel Doty set about to put in crops and harvest the land. It was not long until others joined them. Other pioneers named Potter, Vaness, Enix, Bunnell, and Vale. Stephen Vale, like many others, had entered into a contract for land with John Cleve Sims. In 1802, Stephen Vale decided he would uh, plat a town. And uh, he platted the town, and, and he named it Middletown. And we're not quite sure why, but at that point, it could be that he uh, named it after a town in New Jersey where he came from. We're not right, quite sure. This is a, uh, the original plat, and it was uh, uh, rec uh, signed and recorded uh, in Cincinnati at, the, uh, at that time, which is the county uh, seat of this area in uh, 18 to on November 1st. On the original plat, there were 52 lots. And uh, they're numbered on here. And you will find, uh, as you look at them, that if you look at the uh, lot numbers in Middletown today, they're the same numbers that Stephen Vale put on there in 18 to. The uh, town at that time was uh, extended from the uh, Miami River up to what we now know, the new YMCA is on the uh, uh, edge of the eastern part of the town. So you can see it was not very uh, extensive at that time. He went to the newspaper office in Cincinnati at that time and put an ad in there about the new town. The ad read, Middletown. The subscriber has laid off a town on the eastern bank of the Great Miami River, about one mile above the prairie, where lots are now ready for sale. The growth of the pioneer settlement was slow as families battled the elements. But eventually, more land was cleared, and farming became their primary concern. While the rich soil provided an abundance of crops, transporting them to market was difficult. If the settlement was to survive, it needed an industry. In 1800, a free black man named Bambo Harris paved the way. On Elk Creek, Harris built the first water-driven grist mill and began grinding grain for the neighboring farmers. Soon, there were mills of all kinds throughout the area. The Freeman Mill on Dix Creek, Elijah Mills Mill on the Miami, Vale Saw and Flour Mills, and the Enix Mills to the north. The mills provided jobs, land values increased, and more people moved in to settle. Middletown had its first industry and was beginning to grow. A picture of Middletown in its third decade looks something like this. From the northeast edge, south to what is now Avalon, the river is lined with grist mills, saw mills, distilleries, woolen and oil mills. Flatboats made from great green oak planks transport a steady flow of goods as far south as New Orleans. At the town center on Main Street from 3rd south to the Bull Run Bridge is the business district. Located there are blacksmiths, tailors, shoemakers, a dry goods store, a tavern, and a druggist. Early settler Abner Ennix has cleared off a wagon road east to the Great Miami Turnpike, now Manchester Road. It is a dusty road, busy with stagecoach and freight runs. Heavy Conestoga wagons carry wheat and corn to the Cincinnati markets. Sheep and hogs have been introduced to the area, and an odd-looking traveler has given the valley a precious gift. His name is John Chapman, better known as Johnny Appleseed. 
Nearby, the communities of Trenton and Monroe have been settled. By the 1820 census, the population of Middletown was 314, and the town had a church, the Prairie Baptist, a doctor, Dr. Carlton Waldo, and a school. Rosella Harper, longtime Middletown teacher. The very first school in Middletown was started in 1805. It was located on one of the Vale Mills sites at West Third Street. When Vail laid out the town, he set aside a site which uh, he wanted known for a public purpose. And that site was what is now known as Maine and Manchester. He really thought that site should have been a courthouse, but the uh, board of uh, the school trustees claimed it. And in 1815, the first brick building in Middletown was built, and it was called Old, Bill, Old, Old Brick, and that was the first school. In the center of it all was the river, the Great Miami. It was to make possible the next big development, the canal. On the advice of New York Governor Clinton, Ohio's Governor Brown appointed a canal commission in 1819, and a survey of the area was conducted. Middletown citizens saw the advantages for the community and campaigned vigorously for a canal through their town. There was a lot of agitation and a lot of but hard work went in to get the canal built. Middletown was resident a canal Raymond Standifer. American history. And wherever a canal was built, that place would have good prosperity and growth and so on. Well, it started right here in July the 21st, 18 and 25. Now, it's mostly built by the farm boys and the uh, farmers in this area. A farmer would take his sons, and everyone then had lots of sons to help do the farm work. And so they would come over and for um, a certain amount of money would dig out perhaps maybe a block of the canal and they use pick, shovel, horses, mules and scoop and scoops and that's all that they had and on top of that they also imported quite a few outside laborers the Irish from northern Ohio and Ireland Germans from Pennsylvania and Germany and Chinese came in also but by and large, it was built by the farmer boys and their dads. They had towpaths in which uh, mules with the long ropes uh, tied to the, uh, attached to the uh, barges or the boats, uh, they pulled it. It was pulled by uh, mule power and horse power. It generally had about anywhere from four to six, maybe even more uh, mules in tandem and uh, they had a driver and that sort of thing, and they went right along a path that was built uh, for that purpose. With the success of the canal, Middletown became a transportation center. Freight boats and packet boats carried goods and passengers through the town en route to Dayton or Cincinnati and beyond. The canal meant economic growth. Middletown became an important producer and exporter of pork and pork products to Cincinnati, or Porkopolis as it was then known. Substantial amounts were collected in transportation fees. The canal locks fed water to new grist mills and distilleries whose owners paid rent for the use of the water. Around lock number one, the small community of Amanda sprang up, and near the Doty lock, a small paper mill began, forecasting a new industry for Middletown. In the fall of 1832, an important town meeting took place at the Black Horse Tavern owned by John Reynolds. Citizens decided that there was a need for a local government and that their village should be incorporated under the laws of the state of Ohio. On February 11, 1833, a law was passed permitting Middletown to incorporate. Elections for local officials were to be held once a year, and only white males who had resided in the town for six months could vote. Although the pioneer women had struggled equally with their men in building the community, it would be another 87 years before they would realize full voting rights under the 19th Amendment to the Constitution. The 1840 census counted 809 citizens. That year, Middletown was an important stop for the presidential campaign of William Henry Harrison. The town had prospered. There was a canal bank, a farmer's market, three large pork houses, and a bridge to West Middletown. 
Middletown had its first elected city council, its first lawyer, and a newspaper. In March of 1840, Daniel Doty celebrated his 75th birthday. His farm bordered the canal and he could sit on his porch and watch his settlement grow. He lived another eight years, but his pioneer spirit never died. We will see it again. Entering its second half century, Middletown was still a river town, bordered by the canal on the east and the river on the west. Although short-lived, the Warren County Canal, called by some the Lebanon Ditch, joined the canal just south of Central Avenue, making Middletown a port town. By 1845, the Miami Erie Canal was completed to Lake Erie, and a trade route to the Atlantic Ocean was now open for the entire Miami Valley. That year, a man named Cyrus Mitchell acquired a small two-story dwelling on South Main Street. Used as a coffee house for weary travelers since 1831, the building was remodeled and the U.S. Hotel became the center of Middletown social life. On September the 18th, 1851, the industry and transportation of Middletown changed forever. Though disappointed at its location in West Middletown, citizens turned out that day to greet the Great Iron Horse. The era of the locomotive had arrived, and the canal days were numbered. In January of 1852, the editor of the Middletown Emblem newspaper wrote, A new era and new prospects were about to open in the history of Middletown. He was referring to the building of a hydraulic canal but his words would apply to several events that year. An increase in water power would mean an increase in industry, and it wasn't long before new factories appeared along the hydraulic. Campbell's Broom Corn Establishment, Barnett Sawmill, Martin and Sutphin's Flour Mill, and the Middletown Paper Mill built by John Irwin and Brothers. Middletown had a new industry and would soon be known as the Paper City. More paper companies and mills now located on the hydraulic, and the town prospered. After surviving a cholera epidemic, the population increased from 1,087 to 2,070 during the next decade. Soon, Middletown had another hotel, the City Hotel, built by the Dell family. There was now a volunteer fire company with a new engine, a telegraph office, and the Ling Van Sickle Buggy Company. The new Libby building at the center of town provided space for several stores and offices. On its third floor was a hall for traveling road shows and community activities. On South Main Street, a dry goods store was opened by the city's first Jewish family. Joseph Lindemann is the grandson of Simon Goldman. He was born in Zyl, Bavaria in 1831. And he came to this country at the age of 16 in 1847. He decided to peddle uh, and, uh, for four years, from 1848 to 1852. He uh, began by walking through the countryside from taking the, uh, uh, not the bus, but uh, the stage from Cincinnati to Hamilton and going from door to door in Hamilton and up through the countryside and across the river to Middletown. And after four such trips, he was able to buy a horse and have sat saddlebags and carry more merchandise. And after another six trips, he was able to buy a wagon. And what he really had was a department store on wheels. And uh, in 1852, he decided to open his first store in Middletown on what is now Central Avenue. It was a department store and actually the largest and best known in this general area. Uh, my grandfather uh, had had stores in Eaton and over in uh, Farmersville, as a matter of fact, in earlier and in Franklin in earlier days. So he was well known throughout this whole section, and uh, the store was uh, quite successful. His merchant tailor was uh, 
Mr. Greathouse, who later opened his own store here, and uh, his son who, and grandson who have operated it since his time. So uh, it was a store for the whole family, as a matter of a, a typical department store. On September 17, 1859, the CH&D pulled into the West Middletown Depot, and a tall passenger stepped out to stretch his long legs. Few noticed him as he gazed out over the wide river at the small community on the other side. In a few months, though, the whole country would know Abraham Lincoln. Later that day in Hamilton, Lincoln delivered a campaign speech and said, This beautiful and far-famed Miami Valley is the garden spot of the world. My friends, your sons may desire to locate in the West. You don't want them to settle in a territory like Kansas with the curse of slavery hanging over it. When the Civil War began in April of 1861, only 26 free colored resided in Middletown. They ran barber shops, home bakeries, and catering services. Blacks had long been discouraged from settling in Ohio by the 1804 Black Laws. Passed to limit a flood of southern slaves to the north, the Black Laws required all colored to prove they were free. The laws were not repealed until 1850. Although Ohio was a free state, it was also a border state, and there were many incidents between abolitionists and bounty hunters. Free blacks were always in danger of being substituted for runaways. The Underground Railroad had many routes crossing Ohio, and one of them passed through Middletown. Many southern slaves were smuggled on canal boats as they made their way to West Elkton, Ohio, a major station. In 1862, a group of local blacks joined a combat unit in Cincinnati under the flag of the Black Brigade. Their efforts helped avert a planned attack on the city by Confederate General Kirby Smith. When President Lincoln issued his call for troops, Middletown responded quickly. The town was distinguished by the actions of Colonel Ferdinand Vanderveer and the 35th Ohio Regiment at the Battle of Chickamauga in Tennessee, as well as Captain Daniel Bowman, and his 93rd Volunteer Regiment, and Colonel L.D. Campbell and the 69th Regiment. Middletown women met in local homes and made bags called housewives for the soldiers' personal items. During the summer of 1863, Middletown citizens became alarmed over the daring raid staged by Confederate General John H. Morgan into nearby Hamilton and Warren counties. But Morgan was captured before he ever got near the city. Early on April 15, 1865, just six days after the end of the war, a telegraph in the U.S. hotel tapped out an ominous message. President Abraham Lincoln was dead, and Middletown mourned. As with most Northern American cities, the post-Civil War years became a period of rapid growth for Middletown. At its center was the paper industry. The early Irwin paper mills now belonged to Oglesby, Moore & Company. A. E. Harding and George Irwin had withdrawn to start the Excello Writing Paper Mill, later the Harding-Jones Paper Company. It was the first mill west of the Alleghenies to successfully manufacture first-class writing paper. Another growing industry had begun years earlier in 1866 when two German brothers named Siebold began brewing beer. Starting with a small production of only 1,000 barrels a year, the brewery was turning out 20,000 barrels by 1900. To keep up with its expansion, the city made many improvements. City engineer Andy Braun explains. Prior to 1875, the main supply of water for Middletown was from the river, the canal, or from private wells. But the danger of fire or contamination of the water supply led the citizens to believe that there was a need for a waterworks. A small sawmill along the hydraulic canal on Water Street was purchased and a deep well was dug to the huge underground water supply. Soon the old water wheel, run by the power of the hydraulic, was pumping city water. The waterworks was placed in operation on April 25, 1875, at a cost of $75,000. Another issue addressed by the city at that time was the need for adequate lighting. Since the Civil War, the gas lamp chimney, 
placed over burning coal oil had furnished adequate light until a local citizen saw the new gas lighting in use in Cincinnati. In 1871, the Middletown Gas, Light, and Coke Company was organized to raise money, and by 1875, gas light was used to illuminate many Middletown streets, homes, and businesses. A paid fire department was established. Bridges were improved. Cement sidewalks replaced gravel and brick. A health ordinance was passed. New banks and schools opened. And on South Main Street, a three-story twin tower structure gave Middletown High School a new home. Old South School served the community for almost 90 years. When the Short Line Railroad was completed in 1872, the Middletown and Madison Passenger Street Railway Company was formed. Tracks were laid between the two depots and Middletown had its first transportation system, two cars driven by horses or mules. Like most Americans, Middletown citizens were now enjoying new forms of recreation. In nearby Cincinnati, the first professional baseball team was formed, the Red Stockings. In 1876, they banded with seven other teams to form the National League, and baseball soon became America's national pastime. Weekly and monthly magazines now brought residents news and information about the country and the world straight to their homes. The decade between 1870 and 1880 saw the introduction of a new industry. And to the list of Middletown's pioneers, a new one was added, Paul J. Sorg. An astute bookkeeper, young Sorg and a tobacco expert named John Auer began an operation which soon became a huge industry. By 1885, Middletown was recognized as the third largest city in the country in the production of plug tobacco. Paul J. Sorg's impact on Middletown was just beginning. In 1881, citizens were introduced to two newfangled American inventions, the electric arc light and the telephone. At the canal and Central Avenue intersection, a 210-foot tower was erected. At its top were eight arc-type lights, and when lit, they could be seen from the neighboring cities of Franklin, Red Lion, and Jacksonburg. When Thomas Edison devised a low-voltage enclosed bulb, the Middletown Edison Illuminating Company began lighting homes and businesses throughout the community. A young lawyer named Charles Brundy helped the city enter the communication age. After his Buckeye Telephone Company received a franchise directly from telephone inventor Alexander Graham Bell, Brundy set up the first exchange in his office. He gradually convinced skeptics, who thought the transmission of the human voice something wicked, that the telephone was here to stay. During the year 1887, six new councilmen met almost every evening to plan the future of their community. Middletown was now a city, having been granted that status by the state of Ohio, and there was much to be done. As the last decade of the 19th century began, Middletown was ready to assume its role as one of Ohio's most progressive cities. A civic movement for improvement was begun with Paul J. Sorg at the lead. In 1891, he bought and remodeled the U.S. Hotel, and across the street, he built an opera house. Sorg sent manager James Brereton to New York City to line up the top traveling shows. The opera house opened on September the 12th, 1891. And for the next 40 years, Middletown citizens enjoyed the best in live entertainment that America had to offer. Middletown began the 1890s with a native son in the governor's office. James E. Campbell served for one two-year term and was defeated by future president William McKinley. Middletown also had a library, an electric trolley interurban traction system, and a new paper company providing waxed paper to the Nabisco Company. Its name was the Crystal Tissue Company. The industrial empire of Paul J. Sorg expanded dramatically during the decade to include the Sorg Paper Company. Years ago, it was a, I think it was the Urban Paper Company. It was a defunct paper company. And old P. J. Sorg, he uh, he took it over. He, Boris he Seabold and worked and at Sorg Paper Company for 47 it. years. New equipment, new machinery, new everything for his son Art, Paul Arthur Sorg. He was finished in school, and he wanted to have Art to have something to do to occupy him. 
So Art Sword was the first president of the Sword Paper Company. Other business ventures for Paul J. Sorg included the Miami Cycle and Manufacturing Company and the McSherry Manufacturing Company. His contributions and influence sent him to Washington as a congressman in 1894, and when he later won re-election to a full two-year term, he took a young local newspaper reporter with him as his private secretary. James Cox would carve out his own political career in later years. In the spring of 1895, the Middletown YMCA basketball team won the Miami Valley League championship. The game of basketball was only four years old, but it was already having an impact on the city. The 1890s were also remembered as the gay 90s. Middletown historian George Kraut wrote this about it. It was an era of social graces, when gay was defined as merriment, jovial, showy, Social affairs were the vogue. The dress was elaborate and formal, but it was a time of fun and frivolity. The graceful waltz was in style and ballroom dancing a favorite pastime. People went to church on Sunday and to Chautauqua in the summer by the quiet running traction line. The people, just like the furniture, were overstuffed. They ate hearty and heavy, with meat and potatoes on every decent menu. The well-proportioned women were the ones to be eyed, Jenny Sorg was considered the ideal matron and the city's leading hostess. There was, however, another view of life. As with most American towns at the end of the century, the lines were clearly drawn between the classes, the rich and the poor. Although the economy was booming and jobs were plentiful, wages were pitifully low. The poor stayed poor while the rich grew richer. Everyone had his place. South Main Street was home to the city's elite. A row of fine mansions in the Queen Anne and Romanesque styles housed the families of the wealthy bankers and industrialists. Elsewhere, small ethnic communities often only a few blocks in size had developed over the years. Social change was beginning to take place for the middle class. The Industrial Revolution had raised their living standard. More citizens were now able to purchase the new consumer products being mass-produced by companies named Del Monte, Van Camp, Lipton, Wrigley, Hershey, and Campbell. They were now enjoying flavored drinks named Coca-Cola and Pepsi-Cola, and snacks called Cracker Jack and Tootsie Rolls. Industry was changing rapidly. In 1890, businesses and industries were all locally owned. But when the large Continental Tobacco Company purchased the Sorg Tobacco Company in 1898, it signaled the age of the large corporation, and big industry was headed to Middletown. On the evening of January 31, 1898, a concert by the famous John Philip Sousa Band was presented at Sorg's Opera House. The beautiful soprano voice of Maud Reese Davies was featured as the band played the classics. The order and formality of an older America would soon change forever. The country was rushing toward a new century, toward a new urban society with a view to the world. America's first step as an emerging world power came quickly. Between April and August of 1898, a splendid little war, as it was called, took place between the U.S. and Spain over Cuba. As others looked on, the men of Company L, 1st Regiment Infantry of the Ohio National Guard, under Captain William M. Sullivan, posed confidently outside the Opera House before departing on April 26. When the war was over, the U.S. had won Guam, Puerto Rico, and the Philippine Islands. America's provincial posture in world affairs was over. The 20th century dawned with a new industry under the leadership of George M. Verity. George M. encouraged a group of sheet metal roofing companies to band together to form the American Steel Roofing Company. And it's that group that decided that what they needed was a steel mill where they could make their own steel sheets. Former Armco so president and board chairman William Verity. Be impossible. But in those days, the amount of steel that they needed was not that great, and they had this unique idea of an integrated steel plant. So George M. Uh, got a assurance uh, from 35 uh, Cincinnati businessmen, and he went to work on trying to find where he should put this steel mill, 
and where he could buy the equipment. And as you all know, he went to Zanesville and Middletown, Ohio. Both cities offered free land and both offered $75,000 as a bonus to put the plant there. Uh, he finally selected Middletown first because I think it was closer to Cincinnati, but also because of its transportation. It was right on the Erie Canal, which was the major way to get raw materials in and out. Two railroads were coming into the area, and it looked uh, to uh, GM as if this was the place to put the plant. Middletown celebrated the news in grand style. On the morning of July 12, 1900, after a ceremony at City Hall, the crowd formed a parade with decorated horses, buggies, and wagons along the horse car line on 3rd Street, turning down the dusty Curtis Street to a wooded area known as Doty's Grove. The new company meant 300 new jobs for area men. Jobs as melters, ladlemen, pitmen, gas makers, and skull crackers. As riggers, fitters, crane men, rollers, and catchers. George M. Verity had earlier stated, I must pin my faith to men. He wasn't disappointed. Experienced steel makers from all over the country soon converged on Middletown to help the young man realize his dream. On February 7, 1901, on the order of plant superintendent Robert Carnahan, the first heat was tapped and another chapter of Middletown was begun. Middletown was still a small city with only 9,215 citizens. Most of the workforce enjoyed decent wages at Armco, the Ling Van Sickle Buggy Company, various sorg-owned industries, or the many paper companies, including the new Colin Gardner Paper Company. The Miami Cycle Company was turning out some of the best bicycles in the world, among them the popular race cycle, a soon-to-be famous motorcycle called the Flying Merkel, and later an automobile, the Ramapa. The bicycle created a demand for increased mobility that it eventually could not satisfy but its popularity and industry helped pave the way for automaker Henry Ford and others. Middletown would soon find itself linked to the product of the Industrial Revolution that changed the world. When Paul Sorg died in 1902, Middletown was already grooming a new leader. The American Rolling Mill Company under George M. Verity was growing rapidly, developing new methods and techniques for producing specialty steels. By 1909, the company was ready to expand. Alarmed by inducements of other cities to Armco, Middletown leaders called a meeting with Verity to plead their case. On November 9, 1909, Verity addressed the group on the subject of Greater Middletown, its possibilities. His speech ended with a challenge. Men of Middletown, what do you say? What will you do? Out of that meeting came a program for a YMCA, a parks and recreation program, expanded school services, a public hospital, and a public library. Library historian Pat Brewer. The first library was in the First Methodist Church across the street from where the present library is located. It was in this little room, it lasted about 10 years, it was operated by volunteers of the church, and then it folded in early 1900s. Well, in 1902, William Todd Hunter contacted Andrew Carnegie to see if he would give Middletown the money for a new building, for a new library, because Carnegie had given library buildings to many cities throughout the country. And Carnegie answered him and said that he would give Middletown $20,000 if Middletown would put up $22,000 per year for the upkeep and also provide the site for the building. Meanwhile, Armco made its expansion. In March of 1910, ground was broken for the new East Side Works to be built on 400 acres of farmland in Lemon Township. A year and a half later, the first heat was poured in the efficient modern facility, and Armco was here to stay. During the first decade of the new century, Middletown welcomed several new companies, including Barkaloo Electric, Shartle Brothers Machine Company, and the Polar Bear Tobacco Company. There was a new train depot, an open-air theater, and a new high school. Middletown had also seen its first automobile, its first auto fatality, Leo Simon, 
and its first train wreck. Longtime Middletown resident Gladys Sebald. It was always a custom of my father, Owen Bannon, to uh, entertain the children of the neighborhood. Our home was on the Phipps Estate, which now is Vail Middle School. And uh, it was his custom to have a large Fourth of July celebration for the children. He had a large fireworks display. And uh, it was right after lunch on the Fourth of July, and he was setting up the display at the end of our long lane. And uh, a phone call came, an emergency, that there had been a terrible train tragedy on the CH&D, and would he please help? And so they, the entire town, they got all the carriages, the buggies and the wagons and the autos that they possibly could get together, and there were thousands of people that went over there on foot to help. There, there were just many, many injured. And of course, we didn't have a hospital at that time. The dead, as many as the undertakers could care for at their funeral homes, and they took the others to the Elks Temple, which was turned into a morgue and also for the injured. In 1904, motion pictures came to Middletown when an old Arizona was shown at the Sorg. That same year, the race cycle won the grand prize at the St. Louis World's Fair, and the Middletown Signal newspaper interviewed two brothers named Wright from nearby Dayton. They had made history the year before with a flying machine. When a new iron bridge over the Great Miami River was erected for the traction line, it promised to make travel to Hamilton and Cincinnati easier. But in March 1913, a natural disaster destroyed the bridge and changed Middletown forever. While local photographer W.E. Watson documented the great flood on film, a first-hand account was being recorded by Edna Palmer Voorhees in her diary. March 25th, Tuesday. Yesterday, it rained hard all day and was pouring down at bedtime. Still more rain today, and thereby hangs a tale. A unique plan was devised for cleaning up the city. Using the traction line, a locomotive with several large cars pulled right into the center of town. Crews began shoveling and loading the rubbish, and in two days, the great task was completed. The flood had destroyed over $300 million worth of property and claimed 428 lives as it swept through the Miami Valley. Appearing in the 1916 Ziegfeld Follies in New York City, humorist Will Rogers stated, All I know is what I read in the newspapers. Middletown citizens were reading a great deal this year. President Woodrow Wilson, running for re-election, told the National American Women's Party that women would get the vote in a little while. They replied, we want it now. In Detroit, Michigan, the Ford Motor Company manufactured its one millionth automobile, utilizing a new assembly line process, reducing the production time from 13 hours to six. As tempers flared internationally over the sinking of the British liner Lusitania by a German U-boat, the United States held desperately to neutrality, but formed a new Coast Guard to be placed on duty as soon as possible. At home, the Middletown Journal editor predicted, the war will end this year. Middletown was prospering and seemed far removed from world events, but within one year, all this would change. By the time the United States entered the Great War on April 6, 1917, the Miami Cycle Company was preparing to manufacture hand grenades instead of bicycles. Meanwhile, Armco had already produced several million shell forgings for Great Britain in its effort to stop German aggression. The company had made another contribution, the Armco Ambulance Corps. Attached to the American Ambulance Service operating with the French Army, the unit consisted of 14 men and seven well-equipped ambulances, all funded by Armco. They became one of the most highly decorated military units in the conflict. 
On the very day the U.S. declared war, the most famous songwriter of the day, George M. Cohan, wrote his stirring call to arms, over there. Middletown sent 600 troops over there, and over here, the community set national records for Red Cross and Liberty Loan drives, raising millions of dollars. On November 11, 1918, it was suddenly over. At 3 a.m., a Middletown Journal Extra Edition hit the streets proclaiming the dawn of a new era. Church bells and factory whistles woke the town and the celebration began. As it roared into a new decade, Middletown saw two additions, a new post office on North Main Street and out on the hill east of town, a hospital. Downtown, the old businessmen's club was replaced by a new chamber of commerce, which, after much deliberation, adopted a new community slogan, Middletown, the Tip City. Tip stood for the city's three major industries, tobacco, iron, and paper. By 1920, the population of Middletown had doubled in just 10 years to 24,000. The city covered nearly 3,000 acres of land, and citizens were building new homes at the rate of over 200 a year. There were 4,500 students in school and 26 churches in which to worship. Middletown Industries now produced 57 million pounds of tobacco, 265,000 tons of iron and steel, and 200 million pounds of paper each year. But in the news signal, editor Paul Banker wrote, Middletown is ready to grow. After another challenge issued by George M. Verity, the Chamber of Commerce initiated the Greater Middletown Program, and it included a million-dollar fund for parks, a new YMCA, a girls' club, and new schools. Teacher salaries had already been raised to a minimum of $1,000 for 10 months' work. Civic pride was never higher, and Middletown was known as the city with a soul. As Middletown honored the past by dedicating a road of remembrance for those who fought and died in the Great War, the city was busy shaping the future. A new Middletown Recreation Association sparked the beginning of improvements for the leisure activities of the community. Improvements like Sunset Pool, the Fresh Air Camp, the Municipal Ice Skating Rink, the Community Center, Camp Hook, the Community Golf Course, Middletown Art Week, and the May Day Festival. East of town, between Manchester Road and Coles Road, was the new Armco Park. Open to everyone, it provided 150 acres of meadow and woodland, perfect for picnics, parties, and all sorts of recreation. Armco Park also included a deer range, a bird sanctuary, and music. On summer evenings, thousands gathered on the hillsides for concerts by the new Armco Industrial Band. Oh, good Longtime Middletown musician Lynn Mendenhall was a member of the Armco so band. Just be surprised what that meant to get the Armco families come out and picnic and have a, a, a concert also along with it. It just meant a big reunion at all times. The fellowship was what I considered it was just a good drawing card to bring out the families for Armco or Middletown. It didn't bar anyone from coming out. After years on the road as premier cornet soloist with the Sousa Band, bandmaster Frank Simon returned home, and the town was filled with music. A new Armco Symphony Orchestra presented a few concerts, but was short-lived when the Armco Band grew from a small employee band to become a musical institution known nationwide. A few miles south of town on Route 4, a new recreational area opened by Edgar and Ernest Streethal and William Rothfuss in 1922. Several acres of swampy farmland were magically transformed into the area's first amusement park, Lesourceville Lake. For a 10 cent admission fee, local citizens could enjoy picnics and family reunions, swimming and boating on the large lake, and dancing in the open air pavilion called Stardust Gardens downtown things were changing. The Middletown Journal moved to a new home on South Broadway. The American Legion was now located in the former home of Captain Robert Wilson on Main Street. The new Middletown Civic Association, the first organization of its kind in the U.S., was set up to centralize all civic and social agencies in the community. Over on Manchester Avenue, two new structures were going up. The YMCA building would house a gymnasium, bowling alley, 
swimming pool, and dormitory. And across the street, the Manchester Hotel would provide overnight accommodations and rooms for large meetings, banquets, and social affairs. In September 1923, Principal Wade E. Miller welcomed students back to high school in the new building on Girard Street. The huge structure had a full auditorium, gymnasium, and room for expansion with 60 classrooms. In 1925, traffic lights were installed throughout the city, and the new ortman stewart bus line made transportation easier as the city expanded to areas like Amanda, Runnymede, Avalon, Upper Arlington, and Oneida. Middletown had also become an air city when a de Havilland Army plane piloted by Lieutenants Crumrine and Eubank landed at the new Middletown airfield, later Hook Field, located on the old Farnsworth farm. Commercial flying was new, but in 1926, many citizens were excited about its prospects and the new airport. One year later, a young pilot paid tribute to Middletown by flying over the city and dropping this message to its citizens. This message from the air is sent to you to express our sincere appreciation of your interest in the tour and in the promotion and expansion of aeronautics in the United States. Charles A. Lindbergh. Only three months before, Lucky Lindy had completed the first solo transatlantic flight from New York City to Paris in 33 and a half hours. His plane, the Spirit of St. Louis, contained sheet metal rolled at the local Armco plant. With the end of the 20s came the end of one era, the beginning of another, and a rousing fanfare. On November 2nd, 1929, the water at the state feeder north of Middletown was turned off, and after 102 years, the Miami Erie Canal went dry. The unsightly ditch would become a beautiful parkway, and the town turned out to celebrate with a huge parade. On December 3rd at 10 o'clock, a new radio program opened with a stirring entry of the Gladiators March, and the Armco concert band was on the air with a weekly show from Cincinnati's WLW station. On the national scene, the 1920s began with a jolt and ended with a crash. In January, America went dry. Prohibition, it was hoped, would help solve national problems with crime and laziness. The experiment wouldn't last long. Another experiment, long overdue, did last. On August 26, the 19th Amendment to the Constitution was ratified, and finally, after fighting for suffrage for 50 years, women could vote. Other minorities were not faring so well, though. Scores of race riots broke out in the North and South between whites and blacks, resulting in the rise of the Ku Klux Klan and brutal lynchings. During a local Middletown election in 1925, a Klan candidate was on the ticket, but lost the vote. On October 29, 1929, the stock market collapsed. Wall Street went into panic, and the Great Depression began. The chaos of Black Tuesday started a chain reaction of events that put many Americans out of work, including the president. Herbert Hoover implored that any lack of confidence in the basic strength of business in the United States is foolish. A few months later, out-of-work citizens standing in bread lines would be waving the new Hoover flag, pockets emptied and turned out. In Middletown, there was little to indicate the hard times to come. At Central and Canal Streets, the new Central store had over 18,000 square feet of floor space on its three levels, and displayed a variety of the latest goods. Although the financial district had seen one bank failure, the commercial bank, others were reported sound. At the very center of town was the new Barnett's Bank building with its classic facade, and across the street, the Middletown Building and Deposit Association opened its new seven-story skyscraper featuring a beautiful interior designed in the latest Art Deco style. On Central at Clark, the old Middletown High School was being renovated into new headquarters for the city government. The structure became available when two new junior high school buildings were opened in the fall. According to Superintendent R.W. Solomon, Roosevelt and McKinley would not only relieve the congestion in other schools, but would offer a new exploratory program for students. A lifelike education would be presented with manual arts taught to the boys, 
and courses in homemaking for the girls. And in March, the Middletown High School band greeted the great John Philip Sousa at the Big Four Depot. This time, Sousa was in town for the first convention of the newly organized American Bandmasters Association to be held at the Manchester Hotel. On the surface, life in the early 1930s seemed just fine, but a more careful look around town revealed another picture. There was talk about the economy, wage cuts and welfare, fewer work hours and less take home. Middletown was no longer a Saturday night town with everyone window shopping downtown. More and more people stayed home, sat on the porch and listened to the Victrola or the radio, laughing through their troubles with Amos and Andy or Fred Allen. Others played cards or went to church. Young people made their own entertainment or tried to scrape up a dime to go to a movie. Some theaters, like the new Paramount on Broad Street, even had live shows. And out on South Main Street, a new restaurant was serving a new Jug Burger for 10 cents. For some unemployed, it was easier to move out of town to a bigger city. Others found new forms of discrimination. Factory jobs for women were scarce and paid less than the men's. When a woman teacher married, she had to give up her job to a single woman. Some institutions kept no women on the payroll, feeling that it was better to keep the men employed. Some lives were little changed by the Depression. Poor whites often took in out-of-work relatives, living 10 to 15 in a shanty and scraping to find extra food and coal. Many took turns skipping meals to make sure those employed had the energy to work. And for blacks, the word depression was nothing new. It had always been around in the form of segregation. In the 1930s, many worked at Armco. Some had businesses and some were domestics, but all had restrictions. Former city commissioner James Chaffee Saunders recalls. I was really one of the victims of severe segregation that I, I would call it. You, you were limited in, in, in the uh, jobs that were open to you as, as black people. I had to live some of that down and, and really reestablish the fact that you could be responsible people and perform. And uh, the end result being I was one of the first black supervisors that Armco had. And uh, this was in 1960. Before that, between 1939 and 60, I dug ditches, worked on railroads, worked on a dump. I uh, probably one of the few people who started at that level and ended up at the corporate level. So I made it, but I'm not one that says that it's easy for others to make because I went through difficult years. Lesourdsville Lake was off limits, as were some city pools and parks. In the theaters, blacks sat in the balcony and in the back row at school. To them, depression was not a new way of life. In 1933, the new president, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, told Americans that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Under programs and agencies named with initials like CCC, NRA, FCC, and WPA, the economy slowly recovered. Although some programs didn't work, gradually more Americans did. And by the time Roosevelt stopped in Middletown during his 1936 whistle-stop campaign, the country knew that happier days would soon be here again. A year later, as one transportation company made its last trip out of town, another moved in. With the automotive boom, the interurban traction service became obsolete. And out of the Middletown airport, ground was broken for a new plant for the Aeronautical Corporation of America, Aronca. The company was about to become very busy. As economic tensions eased in this country, political tensions in Europe were stretching tighter. Holding the noose was German dictator Adolf Hitler and Nazism. America remained neutral and at the New York World's Fair had its eyes fixed on the future. Hitler, meanwhile, had his eye on Poland. After the long struggle of the Depression, Americans needed entertainment. 
In 1939, they listened to Burns and Allen, Jack Benny, and Our Gal Sunday on the radio and went to see motion picture classics, Gone with the Wind, The Wizard of Oz, and Jimmy Stewart in Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. Meanwhile, Mr. Roosevelt stayed in Washington for a third term. Hitler marched into France and Europe went to war again. In November 1941, America celebrated four heroes of democracy that looked out over the Black Hills from Mount Rushmore. President Roosevelt, meanwhile, looked for peace. He appealed to Japan to cease its military adventures in the Pacific. On Sunday, December 7th, at a place called Pearl Harbor, Japan responded. We interrupt this program to bring you a special news bulletin. Japanese have attacked Pearl Harbor, Hawaii by air. President Roosevelt has just announced. Monday morning, the president asked Congress to declare war. Six and one half minutes later, America was in another world war. World War II was a long and bitter struggle with Americans fighting on two fronts, in Europe and in the South Pacific. Middletown men and women served with distinction overseas, and at home the cry was, use it up, wear it out, make it do or do without. America wanted victory. Local companies set aside land for victory gardens. Victory book drives collected books for the troops. Cans were collected in victory trucks, and money was invested in victory bonds. And at last, victory came. In May 1945, Allied forces overran Berlin, and the Nazis surrendered. Three months later, a B-29 bomber named the Enola Gay dropped a single bomb on Hiroshima, Japan. World War II was soon over, but the atomic age had just begun. Victory had its price. Over 4,000 Middletown men and women left the city to serve during the war. Many, including Congressional Medal of Honor recipient Patrick Kessler, never returned. Those who did set about to help Middletown with projects put on hold during the war. In 1947, the Voters League drew up a 14-point improvement plan and the city began its work. The Middletown Bicentennial Commission Chairman points. Knight Goodman. Basically, the 14 points called for a revised charter, a full-time city manager, better uh, hiring procedures for the city and other things that were detailed really but the major things was a charter and the city manager and then the city commission delegated a committee of uh, citizens to re find and recommend a city manager while the city had its plan one citizen had been implementing her own Bertha Perkins served the community for many years as a caretaker of the needy, inspiring others to take up her work in later years. As it had so often in the past, the community responded to a challenge. In the next 10 years, from 47 to 57, we probably had uh, around 12,000 people involved. Now, may in some cases, it may be the same person twice, but 12,000 people involved in some 20 or 30 projects. When we started, no one was thinking All-America City, but after 10 years of development and progress and community togetherness, uh, it was decided by the Middletown Industrial Council, which was a part of the Middletown Chamber, to go after the All-America City Award based on what we'd accomplished in 10 years. The effort paid off in 1958 when Middletown was named an All-America City for 1957 by the National Municipal League and Look Magazine. But it hadn't been all work and no play. Basketball great Jerry Lucas explains. As World War II drew to a close, America began to renew its interest in sports and recreation. The popularity of games like basketball began to grow in towns across America, and Middletown was no exception. From a period from 1944 to 1958, Middletown high school teams won the Ohio State Basketball Championship a total of seven times. Middletown was indeed the capital of Ohio basketball. Basketball fever swept through the city during this period. Year after year, citizens eagerly awaited the beginning of the basketball season to see if the next MIDI team would bring home another championship trophy. Jerry Lucas and his high school coach, Paul Walker, recall. 
you could have made our ball club as a freshman, but I had to wait till you were a sophomore before you came, and then you played uh, three years in a row, and we won 76 in a row, and so that was a pretty good three years. Oh, I think the thing that really got us to that point was starting kids as young as they did. I know I began to play in fourth grade. That's right. Oh, those were great years. We had kids playing out, and we had a great school program, the junior high program, and, and of course, you guys played out at the parks uh, all summer, and uh, that developed a lot of our basketball players. You know, I know I probably got most of my experience at Sunset Park. During the season, city events and activities were scheduled around the games as fans packed the gym or listened on Middletown's radio station, WPFB, first licensed in 1947. And at tournament time, convoys of cars followed the middies to every game. Through the years, these former MIDI stars and others developed a unique bond, formed in a time of great civic pride and accomplishment. They created a tradition of excellence that for years inspired local athletes to achieve fame in many different sports. They share a common spirit, a special magic called MIDI magic. In the fall of 1960, America watched and listened as two young men campaigned for the presidency of the United States. Though clearly divided politically, Democrat John F. Kennedy and Republican Richard M. Nixon both symbolized an America on the verge of great change. The 1950s had been a decade of recovery after World War II. At the 1953 Middletown High School Prom Jubilee, three singing sisters from Middletown named McGuire were the featured entertainment. Their sweet harmony symbolized the present mood of the nation and their records soon sold in the millions. For most Americans, the 50s had been a boom time. There were big new cars to drive, clean suburbs to live in, drive-in movies, and drive-in restaurants, and a new form of entertainment called television. As America tuned in to the great political debates, there seemed little to worry about. While teenagers danced to the new rock and roll, just below the surface of the good light, things were beginning to rumble. A Cold War with the Soviet Union was heating up as both countries developed and tested new super bombs. In Southeast Asia, U.S. troops fought North Korea to a stalemate in what was called a United Nations police action. In Washington, a senator from Wisconsin stirred up national paranoia over communism. And in 1954, the Supreme Court ruled that segregation by color in public schools was unconstitutional. The two presidential candidates visited Middletown during the 1960 campaign, both promising a bright future for all. In November, it was Kennedy who won in a very close race. After a weak start, the new president began to show some strength in dealing with Southern segregation and communist expansion. But in November 1963, bullets rang out in Dallas, Texas, and the president was gone. The 1960s were here. Like communities throughout the country, Middletown was in shock. It would last for another decade as riots, rebellion, and the Vietnam War shook the country's foundation. But out of the chaos came change. Old barriers were broken, and new opportunities opened. In 1963, Mary Lord became Middletown's first woman city commissioner. And six years later, the city elected a black man to the commission, James Choppy Saunders. I said, if you go to the company that I work for and they say that they will support me, I'll run. I said, not being too interested in politics, but I will. I think there's a need. We both recognized the need for black representation. We thought that it would kind of quiet this community down, and which we did manage to do. The price for change was not cheap, however. Over 46,000 Americans gave their lives to the long 10-year struggle in Vietnam. Middletown veterans included another Medal of Honor winner, Sergeant Gordon Robert. As the country struggled, Middletown focused on building the community. The Middletown interchange of Interstate 75, just east of town, now made access easier. In 1965, Armco began a massive expansion program called Project 600. It would propel the company to rank as the country's sixth largest steel producer. 
A year later, Miami University opened a branch campus in Middletown on the beautiful setting that had once been Armco Park. Fenwick High School had opened a new building on the same site in 1962 after operating for 10 years in the Old South School on South Main Street. Fenwick students would soon establish a record of excellence in academics and athletics unequaled in the area. Entering the 70s, Middletown's population was at its highest at 48,000. On the expanded north-south thoroughfare named Briel Boulevard, a new Middletown High School was now open, and plans were underway to change the downtown area. The local calm was broken in early 1970 when heightened racial tensions led to walkouts and riots at Middletown High School. Student demonstrations and fires closed down Miami University in Oxford, and led to the closing of the branch campus in Middletown. The community was now forced to look firsthand at problems that had plagued the nation for years. By the time Middletown celebrated the country's bicentennial in 1976, much of the downtown expansion was completed. There was a new city government building, a soon to be completed center for senior citizens, and a new center for the arts. The arts had been an important part of the community for many years, but during the 1970s and 1980s, they flourished. Former Monroe resident David Bell now lives in Los Angeles and composes music for TV and the movies. Other cultural things uh, around Middletown actually revolve around uh, my father quite a bit um, because he was the uh, choir director at the Episcopal Church, the Church of Ascension, and uh, the choir there did a lot of very adventurous works, Bach, and, and so forth. And then he had a group called Pro Musica, which was a choral group made up of a lot of professional musicians in the Middletown area, mostly other school teachers, uh, vocal music teachers. And uh, again, they did, they did works that you couldn't dream that a town this, side, this size could produce. Uh, the Bach B minor mass, uh, Brahms, uh, the, the, the songs, and... Uh, did really, really good work. I, I can now, as a professional musician 20 years later, I can look back on that and say, that was pretty amazing stuff that was going on here. The band at Monroe High School, uh, the marching band, the concert band, jazz bands, I was always involved in that. And then the occasional summer production here at, in Middletown, the Middletown High School, uh, Broadway shows. Um, there was a lot going on. I mean, I stayed very busy. I don't Middletown was known as an arts community. It was also a volunteer community. It's just been a way of life for most Middletonians, and this includes myself. I, I'm a volunteer. I've As others had for decades, Middletown citizens in the 1980s got involved in their community through dozens of organizations and community events. During the decade, the city gathered to display its patriotism at All-American Weekend and recognize its international ties through Midfest, The city gathered in parks to enjoy music and play sports. The city gathered to study and educate. The city gathered to worship and celebrate life. A city is a gathering place, but the spirit of its citizens make it a community, a home. In 1991, the city gathered again to celebrate a pioneer bicentennial. The American spirit that has given the community its rich history stands ready to guide Middletown toward a new century.